Hello viewers and listeners. My name's Peter Fox. I'm from uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in Troy, New York. And uh, I've been asked to contribute to the discussion of the, the Data Help Desk today at the EGU Virtual Assembly. And I was sort of given fairly free reign. Uh, I decided uh, with some encouragement from the AGU folks as editor-in-chief of uh, Earth and Space Science that I'd fo focus uh, a little bit on open science and perspectives from the journals, especially related to data and software. And I have Matt Jim Poehler, Margaret Motion, Shelley Stahl, uh, my editors at uh, Earth and Space Science and the editorial staff to, to thank for this. And in case you haven't met me, that's me, bottom right hand corner, just so you can possibly avoid me if you need to in the future or track me down if you've got a paper that uh, is, is with the journal. Encourage uh, this material to be reused. You'll see the um, Creative Commons on the bottom left there with attribution and uh, certainly for non-commercial use. But what I'm about to say is my, are my opinions, my views as editor-in-chief, they don't reflect the AGU um, or the publisher. Earth and Space Science is uh, now five and a half years old. Uh, it's a gold open access journal and it features three main article types, research articles, and two types of technical reports. Uh, it's not a data journal per se, it's not even a data science journal. It's a science journal that strongly focuses on data methods, algorithms, and, and you'll see more in a minute. Two of the very important features of Earth and Space Science is that it features prominently in special collections that are collaborative with other journals and that allows the publication of materials that otherwise wouldn't go with the science articles in those collections, but allow them to be part of the virtual collection, the special collection. And we are also uh, a venue to receive paper, transfer papers from other AGU journals. Uh, the editorial board, uh, you can see down there, some of you will recognize some names. And just to show that I know a few people, um, in the top right there, Helen Glaves and, and myself, uh, that was at the Research Data Alliance meeting uh, a couple of years, two years ago now, I think. And so hopefully you all know who, who Helen is, incoming EGU president. <clears throat> why am I giving this talk and why is this a hot topic for me? Because I'm going to ask you for some help at the end uh, across a whole range of roles that, that many of you listening or watching might play. And this is a statement that I've used uh, to have conversations with the other editors and chiefs of AGU journals. And uh, it's a whole, this whole concept that Earth and Space Science welcomes transfers of articles. And, and the reason why we welcome that and, and one of the criteria is the first red uh, word here, and that is usefulness. So potential for future use is emphasized over new science results or perceived impact or even citations. Now we have scientific rigor, but the, uh, the lower part in red, uh, I, I feel is very interesting. You know, publication of negative results, descriptions of data, algorithms, methods, instrumentation, models, software, sensitivity studies, evaluation studies that don't traditionally fit in other journals. And this uh, causes things to be a little more complicated than they would be for a traditional science journal. Now, the response to this uh, opening up, if you like, of Earth and Space Science to collections and transfers has had a very uh, significant positive response. On the left there, uh, you'll see the, the change in manuscript numbers and the percentage change in manuscript numbers uh, with Earth and Space Science compared to some of the other uh, very popular AGU journals. And on the right, you'll see a table that indicates the number of transfers per month that come to Earth and Space Science. So you can see that we are dealing with a very substantial population of articles that are coming in from other journals. And these are, these are transferred in not just um, without consultation, but I, I consult and I read every single paper that is, is suggested for a referral and consult with the editors in chief. And the, the criteria for Earth and Space Science, especially around data and data availability, means that there's a lot more work to be done before those papers are suitable for ESS. AGU journals, and thanks to Matt Jimpola for this, uh, this image here, <clears throat> certainly support open science. And we've got, an e I think of this as an ecosystem. The 
uh, colors of the circles there represent the types of open access. So gold, green, blue, and then of course there's a gray one. And I'm going to, going to not spend very much time on this, but, but overall this is the ecosystem of how uh, AG supports open science across all of it, its journals. So one of the things I just want to mention, some of you will be familiar, is ESOR. It's the preprint archive that is supported by AGU. And um, it's, it's active, and at the time of uh, submission, you can um, automatically, uh, you can either submit directly to ESOR before you go to any uh, AGU journal using an ORCID uh, authentication mechanism. But now many journals, and Earth and Space Science is one of those, is you, you get to check a box, and your article is also directly deposited into ESOR after it goes through the ESOR curation review. Now, I'll say a little bit about this later, but that is the submitted article. That's not necessarily the final article, but as your paper goes through the journal process, the review process, it gets updated in ESOR. It gets a new digital object identifier so that you can distinguish between different versions, and that turns out to be uh, quite important. <clears throat> it turns out that uh, roughly only about 15% of articles submitted to Earth and Space Science have the box checked to transfer the article to ESOR. That's just a, a data point. The other uh, thing that I want to mention in terms of supporting op open science uh, is related to project credit, which, which comes from the European Union. It's a, it's a project that's now uh, completed, but it asks the question, does attribution and credit promote open science? And there, was a, there were a set of very nice activities uh, lots of good use cases and questions to ask who gets credit for what. And really what the, the primary output was a role taxonomy, which you can see on the right, that identifies roles that particular authors play in uh, for their, getting their name on the paper. And I've highlighted in bold and italics, software and data curation. And these are, of course, very, very broad roles. And as you might imagine, when a journal like Earth and Space Science has a lot of software methodology, data curation coming into play, there are, there are fine grain roles that people play. And so one of the things you'll see I'm going to ask you later is who, who might work on extensions for what the, the software role is and the data curation role. So keep that in the back of your head. The really nice thing is that Wiley, as a publisher back in 2019, uh, added support in the uh, journal submission system, GEMS, so that uh, when you submit the paper and you add your authors, you can check the boxes very, very easily. And this is currently an optional feature. But the nice thing is that it then shows up in publications. And I just pulled one here from JGR Atmospheres. So you'll see the arrow pointing to the contribution of, in this case, the, the first author, Tyler. And uh, if you go across the other authors, similarly, it brings up the, the roles that they play. So this is structured information that's being provided by the journals and is available for other purposes, such as showing up on the author's individual pages. Now, fairly soon, uh, I'm going to take the move uh, after I write a couple of blogs to make uh, credit, the identification of these roles, mandatory for submissions to uh, papers submitted to Earth and Space Science. So it's going to be a requirement and um, it's a little bit of an experiment. So we'll see how that goes. Also, Wiley, you know, is, is done a great job to help open science. And one of the ones that is, of, I think, great topical interest and it bears directly on how we treat data av av availability statements is if that data availability statement is identifiable as a separate piece of content, it will show in front of the paywall. So even if you can't see the paper, you'll be able to see the data availability statement and thus contribute to the open research concept and open data concept without having to purchase the article, which I think is really very, very cool. But it has implications for authors and it has implications for the robustness of those data availability statements. Uh, the third item which uh, Wiley has put in place is the notion of open research badging. And uh, these journal, uh, the journal articles, uh, you can also identify when you submit the paper, 
about open research practices and they will show up as a badge on the page for the paper and also for the author. And this is very popular, especially with young authors. It's not quite as common in earth and space science yet, but it's very popular in other, other uh, publishing fields. So if we go look around the ecosystem now and uh, think a little bit about earth and space science, uh, certainly uh, the, a lot of boxes are checked if you like, and, and have been uh, for a while in terms of earth and space science supporting open science. Talked a little bit about the preprints in ESOR. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a forcing function for, the, for this open science ecosystem. By now, I want to spend most of the rest of this uh, time to get you thinking about uh, what FAIR means for um, earth and space science. And really what it comes down to is that the culture, even around open science, but certainly around uh, the contributions of data to scientific articles that would go to a journal like Earth and Space Science, has a lot of cultural heritage, if you like, rather than baggage. And we all know that you can impose things and ask for things, but culture eats strategy for breakfast. And so this is what I've been concentrating on over the last approximately year and a half as, as editor-in-chief. So just to give an example, when I when I came in, I'm, I'm looking at uh, where we were with papers, you know, being, um, you know, open access journal. And I just went through a selection of papers and some fantastic papers that wouldn't normally appear in, in the other AGU uh, journals for science, but provided tremendous uh, data sets that had never really been written up and, and made uh, visible before. But in so many examples, the data availability uh, uh, was go to the highest level website that you can find. And then you figure out, try and figure out, go through the paper, figure out how, what products they were using, what time range, what spatial location, uh, what parameters they had picked up. And that was the state of play uh, over a year ago. And of course, things changed in, in um, August of 2019. Uh, with the AGU change in the publication data policy. So my ed job then as editor now, which is, you know, um, six, eight months in the, in the making, is that we've had to provide much more uh, detailed clarity on what this FAIR implementation means in Earth and Space Science for its data statements and compliance with data policy. And really, I have been very, very strict since all papers come through me about data statement compliance. And I have rejected a very large number of papers, uh, reject and resubmit with instructions of exactly how they need to start complying with the data availability statement. AGU uh, very recently, just this uh, year, 2020, put in place a new decision option of minor revision data. And what that does, does is it doesn't reject the paper, but it gives you the opportunity to make a minor revision before, the, before I send it to an editor and, and thus uh, out to reviewers. And what this means for me is I get a lot of interaction with authors and I would say many just do not understand it. And I, I find there's a lot of confusion about some of the language that's used in uh, FAIR implementations and FAIR requirements and it's somewhat complicated and a little bit jargony in places and so you'll see that I'm going to ask you to help me out here. I also need to give guidance to the editors on uh, what their decision criteria are for data and software and what level of compliance because uh, we could easily just stop publishing papers if, if we were to have to follow every single uh, thing that's in the publication policy and I just won't I just won't do that and of course um, we now have humanities data social science data and that introduces privacy concerns and actually FAIR is pretty good about this but what it means is the narrative in the data availability statement has to be much much more carefully thought out so these are editorial actions that are that are certainly ongoing and so let's look at maybe I just pulled out a couple and these are papers in review. These are not published papers. Uh, you know, it, it's getting, it, you know, it's getting better. It's getting a lot better. So this is an acknowledgements and data section. And, um, I'll, you know, I'll give you a second to just just look at it. It says, OK, we're using products 
zero two, zero three, and zero four. Uh, but zero one, which is the raw science product, was extracted and converted to engineering units. And you can find it at this particular place in a converted form with documents that describe the data and the format. That's fair. It's, it's like, thank you, thank you, thank you. And then they go on to give DOI, dereferenceable uh, identifiers for the, um, for the other data sets. And then they go on to say, algorithms, uh, here's, here's where you go get some information on that. So we're getting there. We're definitely getting there in terms of data availability statements. Now, this one will, will need some re require, uh, review uh, updating before it gets accepted. But I, I just want to tell you there's great hope. I, I really like it. Here's another one <clears throat> that I pulled. Some Also some great um, detail here. The, the, the models that are used have, have been placed in Zenodo. And um, and URLs there of how you um, how you get to the, the certain codes, and then the meteorological uh, uh, access, and then there's inventory data, and they tell you about access. They're available after login. Now, so this is this has the makings of a good data avail availability statement, and then you get in the bottom right hand corner, and this is what I, I see a lot, and that is again this defaulting to dumping people in at the top level websites and making them figure out exactly what they go need to go search for. And in particular, the, the, the uh, meteorological site um, from China um, is the default is in Chinese language. They've just put it in an English version, but it, it nowhere meets the criteria for uh, the publication data policy. So this one, of course, will be revised. But it was sent out for review because they've done, you know, an 80 percent, 80, 90 percent job on the data availability statement. So these are the types of actions that we're taking. So here's my call to action. And we're almost done here. Um, I've got uh, I've got uh, five needs here and the five needs are readable guidance for reviewers. And this is something we're working on. The editors are working on with AGU staff. Uh, for what it means to assess a paper from a data method software samples perspective, because the, the guidance has not been particularly uh, clear or simple. We also need the data and software curators, i.e. the two roles in the feature and credit, to consider and participate in what would the sensible enhancement be for author roles in credits, so that when a paper is submitted, it doesn't just say software or data curation. Now, I just want to I want to be careful what I ask for here is because the data folks and the software folks would come up with a nine level deep complete taxonomy that includes every possible role and, and fine grain and nuance. Don't do that. Please do something very simple um, that, that, that will not scare the authors away, that is representative and does a good job at representing those roles for authors. I also need, if you're an author listening uh, or viewing, take the spirit of fair very seriously and uh, look for good examples in other, in other papers and ask an editor because there is variation among the journals for what we're looking for in, in terms of compliance. So that what's the, what's the amount of fair compliance you need for a given journal based on on the type of either data or other materials that you are contributing. And I also need the publishers, I don't know if any of uh, those people are listening, to con continue to leverage the structured content that we're starting to build into re as requirements for uh, these submissions. Because what, what it will do is it, it, will, it will help our ecosystem, our open science ecosystem. It'll help the authors. It'll encourage to help change the culture when people begin to see more and more and more data availability statements that are very clear and even outside paywalls, but have the, the type of detail that we really need uh, to promote open science, as well as people getting credit for the roles they play and the badging I think is, um, is going to be important as well. So I need you all to work on, on culture and, and do it deliberately and don't try and boil the ocean in particular but I, I think there's really been some great progress. So I'll leave you with one thing. And this is a, a slide that I had from a 
presentation at EGU last year. And I'm, I'm really just going to put it up again because what, what we're still talking about inside the journal is this idea of having a, a fair readiness level, similar to a NASA technology readiness level for papers and for the data and the methods and the software. So you might have a paper and it might be at various stages of the journal process. And then there's a score of one to nine uh, to address findability, accessibility, interoperability and reusability. And I just give you a, you know, a made up example here. And, and really what we're looking to do, of course, is like most readiness levels is by the time they get to the published stage, then um, they need to be really quite high in terms of uh, readiness levels. And uh, I also want to acknowledge that um, Margaret Mershon reminded me that shame works too when uh, a colleague's paper has all these, these uh, good high ratings and yours doesn't. Um, there's really an incentive there. So I just want to leave you with that. And uh, hopefully you're all having a, uh, a good virtual European Geosciences Union. And I appreciate your attention.